जी फातिमा यहाँ तो आवाज आ रही है ओके आम ऑल राइट थैंक यू اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاه والسلام على اشرف الانبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين ابي القاسم محمد وعلى اهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين الذي اذهب الله عنكم الرجس اهل البيت ويطهركم تطهيرا اللهم صل على محمد وال محمد رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي وفضض امري الى الله بصير بالعمال السلام عليكم ايفري ون ام ام ويلكم تو اور سيشن ان تو قران سانكتوري وي ار ديسكسنج سوره فاتحه اند وي هاف اولريدي هاد ثري سيشنز ان تو ذس بيوتيفل سوره and i think we're still uh, discussing the very initial uh, aspects uh, very initial verses of this sura and we were discussing the names of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rahman and rahim and uh, we also discussed um, an overview of the sura in certain aspects so that they could be helpful for us in our daily prayers now the idea of fear and rahma go hand in hand um there is a mystical explanation uh, towards the idea of unity and multiplicity and uh, ibn arabi who is also called sheikh al akbar uh, because he was a master mystic uh, and is a master mystic of all times and recognized by all schools of thought worldwide he's known for his uh insights his mystical experiences and his work and he goes on to explain a concept called nafsa rahma and nafsa rahma meaning the breath of the compassionate and the breath of the compassionate is that breath that brings uh the non manifest into the manifest to simply explain it from the human aspect um uh sorry the slides are not matching with what i'm saying um this is better um so actually you know let's do this so nafsar rahma to simply explain it from god's perspective is um when the non manifest becomes manifest or something comes out of nothing and uh the idea is that if you look we we see that uh, allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that you know i have created you in my image uh he he has made us his vice children representative and the quality of the representative is that that the representative has to have a lot of qualities in common with the with the one they are representing so when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that i have made you my representative that means that there has to be some uh similarities uh in in who we are compared there's no comparison of course but there's a reflection of god um there is also an ayah in the quran where uh allah says fitratullahi uh fataranna something like that so i i don't have the uh, uh, ayat address with me right now and i don't want to take up your time so uh, the ayat is there which is saying that allah's fitrat uh, is what is in us the the fitrat of the nas right so uh, there is that uh, aspect of uh, uh, there is just a second i'm going to so there is this aspect of us reflecting the qualities of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala his beautiful names and uh, what nafsur rahma is saying is that when the essence manifests itself the essence that is not seen the nothingness which cannot be observed 
uh, when it enters the realm of manifestation and it enters the realm of something that can be observed that is uh, real in terms of the observable eye, then it is that breath. To explain it from human perspective, uh, the words we speak are a result of our breath. And the words we speak come into being because of the breathing we do in and out. The breathing in and the breathing out is a process that creates sound, creates voice. And so there was nothing, there was silence and then a word was spoken. And so the, the breath of the human being is this sign, uh, uh, an ayat, uh, for us to make some sense of the way the world exists. Now, the reality and the temporary nature of, of this life can also be understood uh, with the very same analogy. If we look at ourselves, we breathe in and we breathe out. I'm saying this word. For how long does my audible sound stay as a reality? What is the duration? Its duration is literally in the now, as I'm speaking. There, it's difficult for me to even articulate the, the amount of time, the life, the, the lifespan of every sound that is uttered, because that is how short-lived it is. That is how temporary it is. And so if you look at the idea of the nafs rahma the, the breath of the compassionate, you see that the existence of the manifested world is just that temporary in the present moment. And this is the temporary nature of the manifested world. The breath creates the manifested world just in the now moment, and that's how long it exists, just as long as my sound exists. I hope I'm making some sense. And now if you connect it to the idea of kun fayakun, he says, be and it is, and it is in that moment. So the creation is an ongoing minute to minute, moment to moment process. And it is the result of his Rahmaniya that there is a manifested world, that there is a world which can be experienced through the physical world. So that the reason we're having this discussion in our discussion with the Rahman and Rahim is because, of course, we're talking about the breath of the compassionate and Rahman and Rahim is all about his mercy. And his mercy, which we also brought up last week, which one of my friends had brought up for us, uh, was that existence is synonymous to his mercy. And to for us to exist is to be a man to be a manifestation of his mercy. To exist is, an, is, is equal to saying that my existence cannot happen without his mercy. So the, the existence of the manifested world is nothing but a manifestation of his Rahmaniya. And um, it is very important that we understand that, um, just a second, I have my notes here. Okay, so um, just as we are discussing uh, the, the Rahmani of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, we also want to understand um, two things which I had planned for today. Um, that when the breath happens, right, the moment of manifestation when it happens, uh, there is a transition from oneness to multiplicity from one to duality, from one to two. And uh, we understand this because it is impossible for us to understand the oneness and the essence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we've discussed this, that me as Fatima can never be understood by anyone. Uh, maybe perhaps not even by myself because I'm a complex existence and entity with so much within me. I have anger and joy and likes and dislikes and I have identities of a mother, of a, of a sister, of a daughter. 
um, of a human being, of a teacher, and all of that together uh, makes me who I am, which is beyond words. It cannot be explained. The minute you put me into words, I am so many things. And in essence, I am just one entity, I'm Fatma. And so the world itself of the unmanifested and the manifested uh, is a, uh, the way we experience the manifested world is coming through God's essence. But because we are in the world of the forms and we are in the world of the tangible duality, we need to understand God from from this angle. And then for us to understand God from this angle, um, God has given us his beautiful names. And in his beautiful names, we find qualities and characteristics for us to have some sort of recognition of who our God is. Now, when we understand this, uh, we wanna understand the same idea of how we go back to unity through Allah's names and and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Holy Quran, uh, in surah number 63, surah number four, uh, in ayah number 63 of surah Furqan, he is giving the description of the Abdul Rahman. So the qualities of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are words. And words are in the world of the form. And therefore, there are so many words. And so there is multiplicity. And therefore, because we cannot have a communication beyond words, we cannot understand the essence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in its, in its true sense. But when it comes into words, then uh, we can say that the qualities of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can be divided into two. Now, there is one aspect that I want to discuss before I go into the division is that um, if we look at Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim and we hear Imam Ali saying that the whole of the universe, you know, the whole of the universe is uh, encapsulated in Bismillah and the whole universe is also uh, an analogy for the Quran, the written book Quran is an analogy for the whole of the universe. Uh, I'm, I'm saying this with reference to the ayah of the Quran where Allah says that uh, we will show you our signs in the horizons and within you and in the book, right, in the Holy Quran. So the Quran is an encapsulation of the universe and the entire universe is encapsulated in, bis, in, in Bismillah and the whole of Bismillah is in the Ba of Bismillah. And the Ba of Bismillah is in the dot. And the dot is the representation of the beginning of the manifested world. Uh, the manifested world begins with the Kun, right? With the beginning at, at the dot. And so we see the importance of this verse, Bismillah rahman rahim Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is introducing himself through this sentence, this verse. And usually, uh, you know, when two words are used, they're used in polarity. So for example, I say, I get angry, but I'm also kind, or I'm, I get angry, but I'm also soft hearted. Um, so there's this polarity, there is north and there is south there is east and there is west there is male and there is female there is a there's an opposite there's a word of opposites and the pairing happens in that sense so um, you know we can say that the weathers are cold and they are also hot but when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is explaining and and giving his introduction he is not saying that i am rahman and i'm also jabbar so if we were to say that the whole can be divided into two halves and then the earth would be like half of the earth is north and half of the earth is west, for example, or half of it is north and half of it is south, then we can say that when these two come together, they make a whole. But when Bismillah rahman rahim comes to us, Allah does not say Rahman and Jabbar. It's as if his wholeness, his entire essence, he is dividing it with Rahman and Rahim. And therefore his essence is Raham. His essence is the womb. 
His essence is only mercy. So there is no place for other than mercy. And that is something that I'm just saying theoretically to you right now. I've been repeating it again and again. But it has to really get absorbed in our understanding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because the essence of our life, the purpose and the intention of our life is growth. And womb is a place of growth. And we need to be embraced in the, in the embrace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is nothing but growth-centric. This concept is given to us by many mystics. Uh, and Sheikh Harif calls it the existential principle of growth. And uh, Mulla Sadra calls it the transubstantial um, motion. And these ideas, they sound like big words, but the concept is that our existence needs to revolve around the axis of the purpose of growth, centricity. There has to be growth. And we've discussed how growth thrives in the presence of mercy and love. But if you look at the human system, the human body, uh, we have read and we know now that if somebody screams or shouts or shows anger, then the, then the frontal cortex of the brain kind of shuts down and goes into a flight of flight or freeze mode. And definitely flight or freeze, fight or flight or freeze modes are not growth centric modes. They are not moments of our growth. They're actually moments of running away. And therefore, how is it possible that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the entity that has called himself our Rabb, uh, would be anything but causing growth? He is the Rabb that takes us as from a seed and makes us into a tree. So when we look at Rahman and Rahim, we see that the wholeness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even in polarity, there is no polarity. There's only Rahman. Now, all his other names, which uh, may look like harsh names, we're just going to go to that, um, are under the umbrella of his name, Ar-Rahman. And today I want to bring in the concept of the division of Allah's Asmaul Husna, which is uh, what our uh, teachers and mystics teach us. Um, so I will come to the concept of uh, Ibad rahman and that a little later. I also wanted to mention that um, I was watching this documentary, Story of God, and uh, uh, Morgan Freeman, he goes and he interviews different uh, people from different backgrounds of religion and he, uh, you know, he's in search of God and uh, uh, he goes to this Buddhist uh, monastery and uh, he asks them, what do you do? And they say that we chant mantras, we chant names of God, uh, of uh, Buddha. And uh, we, we give these mantras for trans transcendence, for self-actualization, for, for uh, you know, uh, being able to uh, enter higher realms. And so Morgan Freeman is there and he says that who gets these mantras? And he says that, well, you have to be under training and all of that to be able to get uh, a mantra. A mantra meaning a zikr, right? the way we do zikr. I've been getting a lot of queries about um, doing askar and zikr. And, uh, and the concept of askar happens in all, it's present in all, all major religions. Hinduism has it for sure. We have all heard of Om and so many others. Uh, Deepak Chopra in his meditations always includes mantras. Um, in fact, he, in his book, one of his books explains that he does not believe in doing meditation without the, the mantras. Uh, and he gives an explanation for that. The same way, Morgan Freeman, he goes and visits this monastery and this uh, master over there, this monk over there, he says that, okay, you know, uh, it's fine. I will give you a mantra. And his mantra that he gives, uh, if you all can see, I, I can't even remember how he pronounces it. 
uh, it says it's the mantra of Avalokitesvara, right? So now I don't, I don't remember. He, he was saying it in a flow and I don't remember how he was saying it. Um, so, uh, so he gives him the mantra, which means the Buddha of compassion. So for us, the name of Allah, Ar-Rahman, is compassion, right? We're discussing the breath of the compassionate. And usually this is the first uh, zikr that is given because this is the beginning. This is the umbrella name. This is the name under which all other names fall. And uh, it's the growth-centric womb. Womb is the place of, place of growth. And now, um, now the, the concept that I want to show you uh, about the division of Allah's names, um, it is the fact that names of Allah are divided into two categories and the names of Allah are divided into the categories of Lutz and Qahar. So Lutz literally means uh, from Latafat, subtlety, and Qahar comes from severity. So gentleness and severity. And this is the explanation. This is where uh, Allah is manifesting Himself in a duality. So from oneness, there is a duality. So over here, you can see on your screens that uh, there are different forms manifesting: lots and kahar, gentleness and severity, angels and devils, intellect and ego. Paradise and hell, light and fire, Adam and Iblis, saints and unbelievers, religion and unbelief, union and separation, expansion and contraction, hope and fear, laughter and tears, joy and heartache, sweetness and bitterness, sugar, vinegar, spring and autumn, summer and winter, day and night, rose and thorn, faithfulness, cruelty. Now these are uh different opposites that we see around us everywhere everything that we see around us is a manifestation of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so everything we see around us is allah's name um what i mean by that is that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says wherever you turn is the face of god and we whenever we see somebody and we look at their face, we give it a name, right? Um, so when I see anybody, um, I will have a name to that face and I will say, well, I met this person. So it's a name. What that name is doing is that it's giving a package, an identity uh, to a certain number of qualities, right? So if I even give a name to a person, uh, for example, I have, if I say I have a friend, her name is Angela. Now, Angela is going to be somebody who has certain qualities, a face, physical and internal qualities. So I'm just making that whole package into a name and then saying, this is Angela. And Angela is represented by a certain face. So there's a profile to it. The same way, everything in the world has a name. And beyond that name, there are certain qualities. So fire is hot. Fire has an image. So that image has a name, fire. And so that becomes a name. And this is something that some, some teachers say is what Hazrat Adam was taught, the names. And therefore, Every human being is a name and everything is a name. And Allah is manifested in all of his qualities through every single atom. Every single atom in this universe has all the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala within it and manifesting. Um, and if you have any questions, you know, I'd love to uh, get take your questions. And if I can answer them now, I will. And if I don't have an answer, I will look up the answer for you and come back to you because these are some deep concepts. And uh, it would be nice if you guys could write something in the chat so I know that something of what I'm saying is making sense, right? 
Now, uh, when we're discussing uh, the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and because we're on the, on the discussion of uh, Allah's Rahmaniya, then we, we are also understanding that, uh, uh, that uh, Allah's names are divided into qualities. And this is a beautiful book, The Tao of Islam. Um, and I want to, I want to share um, a concept here. Uh, just bear with me if I can uh, open my, uh, I'm just going to stop the share for a second. Uh, I need to share something else with you guys. Just give me a minute. Okay, um, I'm just going to start the share. Okay, so um, we were discussing how the breath of God and its connection to speech and how it creates manifestation. Um, Did we close the, the we, barbecue? Would somebody like to say something? Would anyone like to share something? Okay, I'm just gonna mute everyone. And in case you guys wanna unmute yourselves, you can, all right. Okay, so uh, we were discussing the breath of God. We were talking about the speech and how speech is a metaphor for manifestation. Now, um, if you look at uh, this image over here, um, one of our friends had shared this and it said that the lungs are the angel wings of the heart, right? And uh, this connected really well with what I wanted to share today because if you look at the lungs, the lungs is where we breathe in and out from. And all the meditations, all the meditation gurus and, uh, you know, all the meditative practices will tell us to concentrate on our breath. When we start to concentrate on our breath and we meditate and we understand the importance of the breath, that is when the heart takes flight. So the lungs are literally the wings of the heart because lungs are helping us breathe. And that breath takes us into a place of silence that takes us to transcendence. Uh, breath is nafaqtahu fihi ruhi. It's the closest uh, we've ever come to understanding the ruh. Allah says, I breath my spirit into you. And we want to go back into touch with our, our breath. We want to go back into our um, connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And therefore, if you look at it, there are two lungs. It's not just one. And so that again becomes a metaphor, two, right? And the two lungs take us to the one heart. There is a journey be happening between oneness and duality. So there is unity and duality. And everything is a sign. Everything is speaking to us of this journey back home. So the heart is that place 
of oneness, the throne of, of the oneness of the, you know, where Allah says that the universe cannot encapsulate me, but your heart can, the heart of the believer can. And then the lungs become that place of the breath of the compassionate. Now, if you look at the lungs, there are two lungs. We can see there are two wings. Um, and uh, the two wings then represent two, uh, something of the two. And the two becomes a duality. And the duality becomes that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates this universe and creates a duality, there's a duality of the light and the dark. There's a duality of the sin and the good deed. There's a duality of, uh, you know, night and the day. And without embracing both sides, the picture never becomes complete. And now if we go further into the concept of the lung and the breath, the breath of the compassionate, we understand that breathing is all about breathing in and then breathing out. That's the process, breathing in and breathing out. And a lot of mystics have given a lot of explanations about what does the breathing in and the breathing out uh, shows to us. But the main concepts that we, we want to look at is the concept of uh, contraction and expansion, right? There's also a beautiful, beautiful hadith that I came across, uh, which says the heart of a believer is between the two fingers now, this is where I want you to pay attention. Look at the Arabic. It doesn't say Allah. It doesn't say Ilah. It doesn't say anything. It says Ar-Rahman. Qalb al-Mu'min bain al Ar-Rahman. So the translation is actually inaccurate. The heart of a believer is between the two fingers of Ar-Rahman. Now, the reason this was so important for me to point out is because in our journey to God, in our general conditioning, we actually perceive Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the one who will either put us into heaven or hell, the punisher or the rewarder. And that is very, in my eyes, it, it just really is not fair to understanding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he is not referring himself in that kind of duality. He's always putting himself within the realm of his Rahmaniya. He is saying in the Quran, I have made mercy incumbent upon myself. He is saying in Hadith Qudsi that my, uh, my mercy overcomes my wrath. And so over here again, we're seeing that Allah is saying that the heart of a believer is between my two fingers of Rahmaniya, it, the two fingers of the Ar-Rahman. And, and that is the breath of the compassionate. That is the contraction and expansion of the heart. He's saying your heart, the heart means kalb. The word kalb we discussed is something which is constantly turning, constantly changing between two states, right? Between the two states, between the two states of what? Two states, but they're both between, within the uh, parameters of his mercy so there is no running away from allah's mercy no matter how harsh uh, we've been uh, you know harshly we've been introduced to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the breathing in and the breathing out the contraction of the lungs in the expansion of the lungs the contraction of the heart and the expansion of the heart it is all within the mercy of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now, what do I mean when I say contraction and expansion? Um, I want to talk over here about the um, states of the soul. Um, our soul goes through states of cubs and bust. Uh, it's showing that my internet connection is a little unstable, so I am... Uh, beautiful. I have this message in the chat, which is saying, so when we ground ourselves, our heart takes flight. SubhanAllah. Yes. Yes. Um, okay. Uh, yes, definitely. And I, and I have a point that I want to discuss here. Um, some of you are actually attending the art classes in which we discuss this. So I'm actually trying not to assume that everybody's aware uh, of that discussion. 
So I'm gonna have to repeat a little bit here. Um, the concept of expansion and con expansion and contraction uh, is something that um, is about the states of the soul. And when we're in a state of contraction, we're in a state of cubs. All right. Uh, we're in a state of cubs, which is a manifestation of Allah's name, Al Qab is the one who constricts. And uh, then there is expansion, which is bust, which is a manifestation of Allah's name, Al Basit. So there's contraction and expansion. Now, a lot of times, uh, the soul is feeling disconnected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we can say there is a constriction. Uh, there is a time of tightness. Ibn Arabi uh, talks about it a lot. In Surah Duha, there is a time explained when the Holy Prophet was not receiving revelation. And so it was a time when he was uh, in a state of restlessness and then Allah reassures him so we go through these states of contraction and expansion. Sometimes the soul is feeling like it's flying, it's connected, everything is making sense, there's clarity. And then there are times when we feel a lot of doubt, a lot of darkness, despair, um, you know, unsurety. And so there are these two states. And the soul has to constantly keep going through these states for its growth. Um, it's as though there are rebirths that keep happening. So you go through that birth canal and you take birth, you go through a contraction and then you're in this expansive world and you take birth. And then again, the soul goes through a contracted period and then expansive period. Now, uh, when we look at this concept of going inward, the journey inwards, um, we can say that it is the expansion of the soul because now we're moving away from the worldly to the soul. The world of the soul is infinite. The world of the soul is unlimited. And so that journey within can be the journey of expansion of the soul uh, away from the contraction, contractive way of life of the material world. So that's from the spiritual perspective. But if you look at the perspective of uh, the world, then going inwards is moving away from the open outwards. Uh, or maybe I'm making a mistake, so I'm just not going to quote it here. I'll, I'll explain it next week uh, because I can't explain it right now. I apologize. Um, so, so, there's, so there are these ways of understanding expansion and contraction. And what I'm trying to say uh, is also something that I want to explain from an ayat of the Quran uh, from Surah 33, ayah number 72. And in Surah number 33, ayah number 72 is where the, I'm just going to read out the translation of the ayat. Indeed, we offered the trust to the heavens and the earth and the mountains, and they declined to bear it and feared it. But man undertook uh, and bore it Indeed, he was unjust and ignorant. Now, I'm referring here to a tafsir that was presented by Dr. Farrakh Taklishfar. And he explains that this is talking about the promise of the Alastu, right? Uh, I don't know if I need to go into too much detail right now because that will become a completely different discussion. So Allah said that, Alastu um, rabbikum, and we said, Kalu bala. Uh, am I not your Lord? And we said, yes. And we took a promise in the world before we came here. And, uh, and uh, the mountains and the skies, they, the heavens, they refused to uh, accept uh, this burden, this responsibility, but the human took it. And then Allah ends the ayat by saying that, but man bore it and indeed he was unjust and ignorant. Kana uh, zaluman jahula. That means he was he was an oppress he oppressed he was an oppressor, and he was uh, ignorant. Uh, now, uh, what Doctor Saklishfer is explaining here is that he's saying that uh, the 
the uh, concept of this burden that we took. Um, to put it in a nutshell, uh, this promise was the promise to manifest Allah's names fully. And this promise to be the representative of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala means that I become a reflection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so in this world, I would be a wali. So this is the concept of wilaya. We also discussed the concept of wilaya when we started Surah uh, Fatiha and we talked about love. And we said what we love is where we want to go. We love what is perfect. And what we, when we love what is perfect, we want to emulate it in one. And, and then when we become like what we um, love, then there's a unity, right? So this is a journey of unity. So I'm just quickly summarizing because I want to make a point. And the point over here is that when we took that promise from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we would manifest his qualities, Allah is saying this, uh, in this ayah that the heavens and the earth did not take this responsibility and we said we would and then when Allah is saying that you were oppressive and you were ignorant what Dr. Sutlishfer is saying is that there is a tafsir which says that um, we were actually foolish and we were actually oppressive that we took on such a big burden on ourselves uh, but there's another tafsir which says that the person who takes upon himself to represent God and to go on this journey to emulate God and to manifest his qualities is now going to be, number one, oppressive towards his ego, Zaluman. He will be doing Zulm on his ego and he will be ignorant to the distractions. He will be ignorant to what takes him away from his path. So what I'm trying to say here is that there is a way to look at things with such different perspectives that the whole idea of contraction and expansion can be looked at in so many different ways. The idea of oppression and, and uh, you know, ignorance can be looked in such opposing two ways. So we have that opportunity to really enjoy this freedom of the opposites, the duality, the duality that we see everywhere. And what is really important to understand is that without this duality, it would be impossible for us to value and understand the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Rumi talks about opposites in so much detail and he says that if in this world there was no sickness, then the doctor would not have been able to manifest his doctorness, his quality of healing. And so for Allah's qualities to be manifested, the manifested world is a world of dualities and opposites of contraction and expansion. That because it is not possible in this realm of forms to recognize the qualities of Allah SWT or the characteristics without opposites. So if you want to experience kindness, then there has to be oppression so that somebody's kindness can bloom. If you want to experience someone's generosity, then there has to be poverty for somebody's generosity to be experienced. It is not possible that there are no patients, everybody's healthy, and there's a doctor. And you can't, you won't, you won't ever be able to experience a doctor's quality of giving shifa if there was no sickness. And so in this world, therefore, we are living in duality. And so the two fingers. Uh, represent in some ways this duality, the duality of the states of the heart, the heart that cannot recognize light if it hadn't seen dark, the heart that cannot enjoy joy if it has not seen sadness or darkness, the heart that cannot experience transcendence 
if it has not experienced that disconnection. So this was our discussion today. And um, uh, when I had taken the poll, I had said that, you know, uh, I would try to keep the session to 45 minutes. So uh, I will not start the discussion of Abad or Rahman today. Uh, and for next week, I would also like to explain what I have forgotten today. So, um, so far, I would like to get some of your feedback into uh, where, where was the discussion okay? Did things make sense? Um, because I felt I was a little disconnected today. What do you guys think? Um, because the whole discussion was about uh, the world of opposites, Lutf and Qahar. Um, right, if you made sense. All right. Um, there was one more coin that's coming to me. Okay, thank you. And so uh, just as a parting uh, discussion, because it ties in so well with Allah's mercy, a very pertinent question comes up about the evil in the world. A lot of people become disillusioned about God when they expect God to just be the one who is always about, uh, you know, the giver and the protector and the provider in the way we perceive it, um, in the way we see it. Um, and uh, the question comes up that how can there be so much evil in the world if God is a Rahman, if everything is in his mercy? Uh, I think we've discussed it earlier, but I would like to explain it again with a little example. I give it again and again. That when we go to a gym and we want to build a muscle, we use dumbbells and machinery that gives us resistance. This resistance, because, make, because we understand it is good for us, we actually go towards it. We go to the gym ourselves. We put ourselves through the pain of using those dumbbells and weights and machinery to uh, create muscles because we know that this kind of heavy duty work and resistance is going to be good for me. In the same manner, the things, the, uh, the things that apparently look difficult, painful to us in this dunya are the dumbbells that are building the muscles of our soul. And through them, we grow. And we keep discussing this again and again. I can recall that we discussed uh, Oprah's example too. So this is something that I wanted to say. And yesterday, I came across Allah's name, Al-Muqsit. And uh, it was a beautiful name because it comes from Qist. Uh, Qist means uh, equal division. Now, we would say that, well, everybody does not get equal division of wealth. There's poverty. Why do some people get more than the others? But Allah's name, al muqsit and as we said, all names of Allah fall under the name of Ar-Rahman. Allah's name, al muqsit is about Allah knowing what is the fair division for each soul. Allah knowing what is good for each soul, in what proportion, in what way. That is Allah's name, al muqsit So for us to understand uh, the, or to make any sense of Allah in this dunya, we have to understand it from the perspective of the soul. And we have to understand it that everything that's going on is actually happening for the soul plan. The plan is the growth of the soul. And that's why this temporary life, which is just the now, which is just as long as the breath, is not the main goal. And just, for, just to end the session, I learned something really beautiful from my teacher yesterday. Uh, we were discussing the breath and he said that imagine the permanence of the afterlife by looking at the permanence of the faculty of our imagination and our thoughts. Imagine that somebody who has a dream to build a house has a thought of building a house, maybe for 25 years. And then it manifests itself, uh, you know, 
after all those years of thinking and imagination and all of that. And uh, we were actually discussing about the concept of the breath bringing about words, right? So I'm sorry I gave the example of the house, but the actual example that the teacher was trying to give was that look at the lifespan of the thoughts and the work and the lifetime that goes into learning words, creating imagination, creating thoughts. How long is that compared to the emission of that one word from our mouth through the breath. So our life is actually as temporary as the utterance of one syllable of that word in the now. That's, that's the reality of this life compared to that long life of the thought in our minds. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. I end my session over here. Um, and uh, I would like to make dua before I stop the recording so that um, uh, if anybody would like to share something or um, give feedback or ask questions, you can do so. So, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Ola, first of all, I ask forgiveness for any shortcomings in the spreading of this word, which is all yours, and I'm just a vessel, but all mistakes are from me, and all flaws are mine, and all mistakes are mine, and I ask for forgiveness for any of these shortcomings, and may you turn these shortcomings into your perfection through your mercy. Oh Allah, whatever I have said, make it a means of goodness for all those who hear it. Even if I have made a mistake, make it beautiful for them. You are the one who is all beauty, O Allah. Give us that gift of your proximity. O Allah, our hearts are yours. We have no power. We are feeble and we're weak and we're confused and we're doubtful. And our states are in constant turmoil and flux and we're changing constantly. We do not see stability. We do not have stability. We do not, we're not made for stability. The only one who's stable and perfect is you. So, O oh Allah, bless us with your guidance and keep us in your mercy as we are because there is no existence beyond your mercy. But we ask for your special mercy, your Rahimiyah, to open our hearts. We're unable to open our hearts, Ya Allah, open our hearts. And then you keep it on guidance. You keep it on Sirat al You keep it in a state of mindfulness and awareness towards you. Ya Allah, help us to reach those states that the mystics achieved and let us taste those sweet flavors of your intimacy ya Allah. ya Allah make our intentions pure ya Allah make us those who follow in the footsteps of your beautiful prophet and his progeny oh Allah give us your guidance in every moment because in every moment we, we struggle oh Allah enable us to make the most of every moment of our lives and make our ahra one that we would be joyful to run towards. Oh Allah, we ask for healing for this world and guidance for our hearts and healing for the ailing hearts and bodies. Oh Allah, give sabr to those who have lost their loved ones. Oh Allah, make this world a beautiful place where we can be kind and loving towards each other and helpful towards each other and turn us away from our selfishness and our greed. Oh Allah, we pray for the reappearance of your holy Imam Mahdi and Allah enable us to be one of his companions. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. If I can request a Surah Fatiha for all of our Marhumeen, please. 